All right, so hello everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me loud and clear. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Damien Sass. Uh, I'm with the UN Office of the High Representative for the Least Developed Countries, Landlocked Developing Countries, and Small Island Developing States. Uh, welcome to this webinar for journalists from the Least Developed Countries, uh, specifically for those of you in the Asia Pacific, uh, and Pacific region. Uh, there will be an identical webinar, although with different speakers for journalists from the least developed countries in Africa uh, that will take place in just a few hours time. Uh, just to note that this webinar is being recorded uh, so that uh, journalists can also come back and rewatch it uh, in, in the future. So the purpose of the webinars is um, it's really threefold. Um, firstly, to provide a, a brief update on the fifth UN conference on the least developed countries, or LPC5 as it's also known, and also in particular to introduce the Doha program of action. Secondly, um, to highlight the work of some of, uh, some, but certainly not all of the different UN agencies uh, that are supporting the least developed countries. Uh, and here we're really grateful to have. Uh, colleagues from across the US system joining uh, as panel members. And then thirdly, uh, part of the rationale for holding the webinar uh, now is, is because next week, um, the UN's high level political forum uh, will begin uh, specifically from the 5th to the 15th of July, uh, where progress on the achievement of the sustainable development goals will be discussed. Uh, if you are interested to follow that forum, it will be broadcast live on UN Web TV. Uh, there is no registration needed. It's uh, broadcast pub publicly. Uh, there will be a session on the least developed countries on the 6th of July from 3 to 5 p.m. local time uh, in New York. Uh, and you can go to the link that you see on the screen. It's hlpf.un.org forward slash 2022, uh, and you'll find the full program uh, there. So turning now to, um, to uh, rather LDC-5, the conference itself, um, it was initially supposed to take place in Doha, in Qatar, uh, this past January. Uh, however, because of the surge in Omicron variant, so the COVID-19, uh, COVID around about the same time, uh, the conference was uh, broken up into two parts. Uh, the first part was a one-day meeting of the UN General Assembly this past March, specifically to adopt the Doha Program of Action. And the second part uh, is the main in-person conference, which will be held in Doha next year from the 5th to the 9th of March. The conference in Doha is where the international community will gather to renew its commitment, uh, as well as solidarity with the world's least developed countries. And over the five days of the conference, uh, heads of state and government will gather to raise new pledges of support um, and also to drive uh, a new impetus uh, that's required to deliver uh, on the commitments that are in this new program of action. So the 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 conference itself will be broken up into uh, five tracks. Uh, there will be a private sector forum, which will bring together international business community, uh, together with um, uh, leaders from, from, from LDCs, as well as development partners, to explore partnership opportunities, in specifically in sustainable energy, agriculture and rural development, connectivity, climate change, and also sustainable tourism. There will also be a track on cooperation to mobilize partnerships with developing countries of the global south. Thirdly, there will be a youth forum uh, to put the perspectives and ideas of young people at, uh, on central stage, uh, where they will be leading discussions ranging from education to health, employment, climate action, uh, and others. There will also be a, for, uh, a, pli a parliamentary forum uh, this is in recognition of the fact that uh, parliaments will play a critical role in, in localizing the program of action into national development policy. And then fifth, uh, there will be a civil society forum. Uh, this will provide a space for grassroots organizations 
NGOs uh, and many others to network, uh, as well as to shape, uh, I guess, the fortunes and, and uh, of communities across the LDCs over the next 10 years. Uh, and so in terms of how all of this will be, will be sort of achieved, uh, this is where the Doha program of action comes in. Um, the, the program of action was negotiated over several months in New York by all UN member states, including of course, the least developed countries, uh, and, and inputs were provided by a range of stakeholders from civil society organizations through to youth, uh, UN agencies, uh, and others. And so in many respects, the Doha program of action uh, represents the will and the commitment on the international community to work with least developed countries in identifying and supporting uh, the key priority areas that, they've, uh, that they have set for themselves uh, for the next decade. Uh, namely investing in people, uh, leveraging science, technology, and innovation, uh, structural transformation as a driver of prosperity, enhancing international trade, as well as addressing climate change um, and, and building resilience to future shocks. Uh, and then lastly, uh, mobilizing international solidarity and partnerships in support of graduation. And so uh, you will have recognized these six topics because as you, uh, you've seen from the webinar program, this is how we've divided the panel discussion. Our speakers will introduce their respective topics uh, and then also share the practical experience of their organizations uh, on these topics. Uh, and so it's without uh, further ado that um, I will now turn to our panel members uh, our first panel member is uh, Fu Kui, uh, who, is, who is an employment specialist in the Regional Economic and Social Analysis Unit of the International uh, Labor Organization, ILO. So Fu, I'm going to hand it over right over to you now. Thank you. Thank you, Damien. And uh, good morning, colleagues, and good morning to uh, all the participants on the webinar. Uh, I'm going to share a set of slides that I have prepared. Um, Damon, I think you may need to provide that uh, access or um, it says you cannot start a screen share while the other participant is sharing. So, I think you should be able to share now and try. Yes, I should have access now. Let me know if you see the screen. I can, yep. Okay, great. So again, thank you very much, uh, Damien. Uh, so this first uh, presentation will look at the first pillar of the Doha program of action, uh, specifically on investing in people. And um, following that, then I'll give a few examples of what the work we've been doing here in the Asia Pacific region in support of this, uh, these efforts in the least developed countries. Um, just very briefly, in terms of the background for this area, uh, it's really much uh, centered on the idea that uh, the LDCs, the main challenge remains by eradicating poverty. Uh, by 2030, there are forecasts that around 30% of the population, about one third of the population will be still in extreme poverty by, uh, by 2030. Uh, there's also recognition that there's a very strong link uh, when we talk about poverty in terms of underserved areas. So there's a geographic or a spatial component there uh, that we're talking about remote areas, rural areas where we have weak uh, connectivity through infrastructure gaps, as well as uh, limited access to social services, social protection. Uh, so when we talk about investing in people, it's really grounded on a couple key principles I want to highlight here. Uh, one is that there's uh, a centrality of human rights, uh, good governance, and ensuring that we're building strong institutions um, to uh, invest in people. And secondly, the other critical component is that uh, we make sure that our efforts uh, towards an um, inclusive growth, inclusive development uh, leaves no one behind. So there's a heavy emphasis that you'll see in terms of uh, supporting women, young people, children, the elderly, as well as other vulnerable groups. Uh, so the first priority here, um, uh, investing in people has 10 different components within it. And I'm not gonna take the time to go through all 10 uh, given our type constraints, but uh, you can see them here already laid on the screen. I do wanna highlight one uh, specific area because there's a commonality that we see in terms of the LDCs in Asia Pacific, which is related to the fourth point on population. Uh, we know that in the LDCs, there's a very high 
fertility rates. And as a result of that, we have very young populations, uh, high shares of children and young people in our LDCs. Uh, so of course that uh, puts a priority focus on ensuring basic healthcare access uh, for that young population, ensuring where investments in education and skills development are there uh, so that these young people can then transition uh, in the right time towards the labor market and in terms of accessing decent jobs um, that are available. So the ILO work in this area for supporting uh, LDCs and investing in people is uh, grounded in our uh, belief in decent work. Um, decent work being jobs that ensure uh, sound working conditions, jobs that provide a fair wage, uh, jobs that provide access to social protection in the form of basic health care, in the form of basic income security, as well as jobs that ensure uh, labor rights and, and social dialogue between workers and, and employers. Uh, so our work is also uh, very much grounded in the idea of the leave no one behind principle. Uh, so our focus is heavily targeted towards women, young people, uh, as well as supporting businesses and workers who are in the informal economy transition to formality, as well as supporting uh, and protecting the rights of migrant workers as well. Uh, let me give you a few uh, more concrete examples so you can get a better sense of uh, some of the work that we're doing uh, at the country level in this area. Uh, so the, the first is one of our flagship programs, the Better Work Program, uh, which has been operational around the world uh, for more than a decade. Uh, here in the LDCs in Asia Pacific, we are also working in Bangladesh and in Cambodia. Uh, so this is a very unique partnership in which uh, the ILO, the International Labor Organization, is working with the International Finance Corporation, and it works closely with governments, international brands, factory owners, as well as uh, factory workers in need to improve working conditions and to really raise the competitiveness of the garment sector. Uh, now, the garment sector is a very important uh, industry because we know that in the LDCs, it has become a conduit, a, a channel which many rural women uh, transition out of agriculture and into paid formal jobs into low-end manufacturing. So it's a, a very important channel to, uh, to introduce workers into the aspects of decent work. Uh, the efforts there in both Bangladesh and Cambodia have led to improved factory compliance in terms of uh, core labor standards as well as national legislation. It has resulted in uh, improved wage compliance, uh, better wages, better contracts, arrangements, occupational safety, as well as working time for workers. And in terms of uh, the number of beneficiaries in Bangladesh, we've reached uh, over 700,000 workers and in Cambodia, more than 600,000 workers. Uh, the second example I'd like to share is our work in Timor-Leste, uh, which is the Roads for Development program. Uh, now, this program takes a very different approach, but it tries to address the issue that I raised earlier, which is that uh, in terms of investing in people, we have to recognize that there's a strong spatial or geographic component to that, and making sure that um, the connectivity gaps are addressed so that uh, rural and remote uh, people can also benefit from this process as well. In Timor-Leste, we know that about 70% of the population still live in the underserved rural areas. Uh, and a lot of these rural areas are, have very limited infrastructure and connectivity. Uh, so this project focuses on uh, supporting the government uh, to design and manage construction projects. But while using a, uh, an approach that uh, really uh, maximizes the, the use of employment, uh, employment intensive methods, which allows us to create short-term jobs for, for the community in which we're building these, uh, uh, these roads. Uh, as a result, we have led to uh, greater access to markets for rural women and men, as well as their better access to public social services as well. The last phase of this project generated around 1.5 million working days, uh, and 30% uh, of those working days were taken up by women, uh, which is also very important so that we ensure a, a gender component to this project as well. Uh, likewise, around half of all contracts awarded through this uh, construction initiative were uh, given to uh, women-owned firms. And finally here, um, the last example I wanted to share in the interest of time, uh, which I know is limited, uh, is our work on child labor. And uh, the example here being in Nepal, uh, with the focus of reducing vulnerability to child labor and enhancing child protection against exploitation. Uh, so in Nepal, uh, the latest estimates show that about one in six uh, ch child is in child labor, about 1.1 million children altogether. 87% of them are concentrated in agriculture. 
uh, more than uh, 220,000 are in hazardous work. Uh, and so the project here, the work that we're doing is a multi-year effort and it really approaches uh, you know, addressing child labor in a, in a multitude of ways. Uh, first, it's about uh, establishing, uh, building the knowledge base about the drivers and causes of child labor and working very closely with the media to raise public awareness about the long-term consequences and, and the detriments of child labor. It also works at the, um, uh, the policy legislative levels by ensuring uh, working on reforms of legislation to be better aligned with international conventions. Uh, but also likewise, it works at the grassroots level as well, uh, supporting communities to better monitor child labor, as well as providing uh, livelihood support to vulnerable families that are affected by child labor as well. Uh, with that said, if there's uh, interest, if you're interested to learn more, please do visit our website. Um, I've left a, a number of links here available uh, for you to explore further. And of course, you can also reach out to us by email as well. Uh, thank you very much, Damien. Uh, back over to you. Great. Thanks a lot for the, um, thanks for that for, for sharing um, your work. Uh, and those work uh, supporting the link to our country um, and, and those examples as well. Um, you know, Timor Leste also is, is one of the uh, small island developing states that is also a least developed country, uh, one of the eight countries. Um, so thanks so much for that. Um, I'll turn over now to um, my colleague Rio Santos. Um, RIAR is a senior UN coordinator uh, specialist uh, in the International Telecommunication Union uh, Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. RIAR, I see you online. I'll hand over to you now. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone from, from Bangkok. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Uh, you can see the presentation. Uh, I, I just want to. Presentation, yeah, and maybe you have to go on to presentation mode, but we can see the slide. Is it already in presentation mode or not yet? I, I did. Not yet. Okay. How do I make that the present? Wait, let me. You can probably just click on slideshow at the top or I think at the, on the bottom right hand corner of your screen, there should be normally like a, a slideshow uh, icon. Yeah, actually I, I was wondering, just give me a minute, sorry. No worries. Anyway, I can't find it. <laughs> um, I'll just try to. Where do you say slideshow? Okay. Um, can you see it now? We can see the slides here. You, you can probably just go ahead. Okay, I just go ahead. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I am Rior Santos. I am from the International Telecommunication Union. Uh, we are the specialized UN agencies working for uh, ICT and development. I am happy to be here, um, and, and, and my topic will focus primarily, primarily on how to leverage uh, science and technology and innovation. Uh, I would like to welcome all our colleagues and, and uh, participants for this uh, for this webinar, um, allow me to focus uh, when when we talk about when we talk about um, when we discuss uh, science and technology. It is always important and uh, to, for us to emphasize that no one is left behind, and ensuring that we leverage technology for those who are really uh, who, who did it the most. And as, as we all know, technology as an enabler allow us to access different services, allow us to be connected with a lot of challenges and, and allow us to connect with the people we love, with the work with, that we do and other things that we normally allow us to perform our daily operation. But at the same time, 
during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, as technology progressed and technology was able to provide solutions to our current and pressing problems, it also increased the divide and at the same time the gap uh, that allows those people to be connected. And as we, our goal uh, is to narrow that digital divide and ensure that we share the equal access and, 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 and proper consideration for all that to have to reap the benefit of ICT and technology. So one of our key initiatives in uh, ITU is the Girls in ICT, where we emphasize the role of young women and ensuring that women has a women and girls consider science and technology as a profession and, and, and allowing them to be interested in this field. And uh, unfortunately, until today, uh, ICT is dominated by male uh, uh, workers. And um, we want to make sure that uh, girls are given equal opportunities and see ICT as an option for their future career. And um, we've been doing this global celebration every year and uh, uh, done with different host countries. And right now it's been very successful uh, and, and reached a lot, thousands of young girls and women in Asia Pacific and globally. So starting with young girls, it is also important that we work with uh, young people, allowing young people to to have a voice in the uh, in in our in our work. Um, we we have a network called Generation Connect that allows young people to actively participate uh, in uh, in all these activities and allow allow young people to have a voice in defining their role in the technology and innovation. All right, Vera, if you're, if, you're, um, if you're doing your slideshow, like, uh, we're still seeing your first slide, just to let you know, sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. Then uh, the other component of, of, of our work is uh, ensuring that the space online is safe for children. And uh, uh, according to the latest uh, research, 80% uh, of children actually have access online. And, and, and this, is, uh, this, is, this is already uh, a huge number and, 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 and also alarming because uh, children are exposed with a lot of risks and threats online. That is why together with UNICEF, we were able to develop guidelines and policies that help policymakers, industry, parents, and educators, and uh, children in um, in addressing these uh, challenges of threats online. And at the same time, we develop some games and uh, lesson guides and 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 uh, online uh, learning online learning modules for children so that they can have access online. I'm trying to focus now on ensuring that uh, the vulnerable groups are, are, are properly addressed by leveraging technology uh, and innovation to, to them. And at the same time, um, while we are uh, addressing the issue and concerns for specific groups, we also need to ensure that the overall space of, of, uh, of uh, of the internet space are safe and our data are protected, our, uh, our financial, in financial institutions are protected. And that is why uh, cybersecurity is very important. Part of our service in ITU is to ensure that we provide uh, technical guidance in assessing uh, the current cybersecurity situation in each of the member countries and allow to propose solutions and, uh, and uh, recommendations how to address these challenges and gaps. We also publish, uh, we also publish uh, yearly a, we call it Global Cybersecurity Index that allow us to understand the country's positioning 
globally in terms of cybersecurity where we assess the legal measures, the cooperative measures, the capacity building needed, the organizational and technical measures where we assess the, these overall components so that we can provide uh, uh, real-time data to, to the government uh, and allow them to address these gaps accordingly to strengthen their cybersecurity. This is critical as we communicate safety and uh, uh, this is critical as we communicate safety and ensuring that cyberspace are, 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 are safe for everyone and allow the government to act on it as needed and compare notes with other uh, countries who have stronger uh, cybersecurity measures and to share best practices to build their cybersecurity uh, uh, platform. Um, then, uh, as we publish this, uh, ITU also provide a yearly statistics for uh, ICT statistics to all member countries. That the, these uh, yearly statistics allow us to 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 give them um, idea on what are the current ICT statistics in their country, and at the same time allow other countries to understand as well and allow regional cooperation and international cooperation to address whichever gaps are, are found on those uh, uh, access and those information. Then at the same time, we also have uh, an interactive map and we, as we promote digital ICT infrastructure in the time of disaster, risk and management, it is also very important for us to have uh, a map that allows us to see where connections are available. The interactive map allows us to, to see all the mobile, all the uh, uh, submarine cable connections that allow us to connect from the global uh, internet connection until to the until last mile connection. This allow uh, this these services provides government to understand what is the best and easiest and affordable means of creating connections so that ensuring that we connect the unconnected. And uh, uh, part of this, uh, part of our approach is to ensure a whole of government approach for digital development. When we talk about the whole of government approach, uh, we, we have 17 goals as agreed in the United Nations, but we need to see ICT and leverage ICT, science and technology and innovation as an enabler to ensure that we reach all these goals. ICT is not a standalone uh, component, but rather a cross-cutting component that will allow us to accelerate the achievement of sustainable development growth, uh, goals, leveraging from the, uh, from the use of technology and ensuring that we provide and accelerate uh, digital services uh, that uh, allows uh, people to have access to those services. And this is part of the whole of government approach, meaning to say there is no one agency in the government that can actually push forward uh, digital transformation, but rather it needs to be a shared uh, initiative and allow different strategy to, 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 to be utilized so that we can accelerate services uh, to the people. When we talk about services, uh, the acceptance of the government to transform digitally should be uh, mandated and should be uh, reflected in the master plan of the government. From that national master plan, it will allow us then to have a sectoral plan that define further what specific ICT requirements are needed, whether it is e-agriculture, whether it is digital finance, mobile health, etc. All of these allow us to use technology, leverage science and innovation, so that we were able, we can, we can address uh, and ensure that everyone can easily access uh, easily access, um, we can easily access services to the government using technology. That includes digital payment, digital register, 
and business registration, accessing your records, etc. But that all requires a uh, different business process and ITU can provide that solution and advise to the government to ensure that they that that we create solution uh, replicable uh, and easy to 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 apply to all government agencies. Uh, uh, in my last two slides, I would also like to share uh, some of our initiatives working with journalists. And, and it's very important that we also allow the media uh, and our uh, colleagues in the journalist, uh, in, in, in journalistic world to understand how technology actually works. Because we sincerely believe that our, in order for us to fight misinformation, is to, uh, to train and build the foundation of, of, of uh, and build the knowledge of our fellow journalists and ensure that they are equipped with the necessary knowledge and information so that they can report and address the issue uh, with confidence and clear understanding on how ICT can actually be, can be used to leverage government services, uh, accountability, and transparency in governance. And uh, as part of that, we also continue our webinar with journalists where we keep in, them informed on the latest ICT trend, uh, starting with cybersecurity, because this is one of the common issues that most of uh, journalists shared, uh, something that uh, they have, they find difficult, uh, difficulty in, in, in addressing or reporting. But with a clear understanding of how cybersecurity works, it will allow them to actually address and, 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 and report it to, to the people. Um, uh, lastly, uh, I'm happy to share this, uh, this presentation. And if more information, you can easily uh, scan our QR code or visit our website. We'll be very happy to provide you a more detailed information uh, of our work and our initiatives for uh, LDCs. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity and uh, good morning, everyone uh, from Bangkok. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Riero. That was uh, great to hear um, for you the breadth of, of the work that you're doing with me at ITU. Um, and thanks for sharing also those very practical examples as well. Um, you know, working with women and girls, um, you know, providing space for online training for, for children, cybersecurity, um, and, and yeah, I just wanted to also mention here that um, ITU's Partner to Co Connect uh, initiative is, is a huge sort of, um, you know, partnership approach as well. Um, that's, that's, you know, made uh, pledges of some eight, 18 million uh, dollars uh, also towards uh, all of the work that ITU is doing. Um, and, and that it also includes supporting the least developed countries. So thanks, thanks for sharing that. Um, so now I'm going to turn over to uh, Sridhar Dharmapuri. Uh, Sridhar is a, a senior food safety and nutrition officer with uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization's uh, regional office uh, for Asia and the Pacific. Sridhar, over to you. Thank you, Damien, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, actually, I'm in North Bay right now, so uh, just to just for reasons of accuracy. So we are from the regional office for Asia and the Pacific in Bangkok. Uh, we serve 46 countries in the region, including the small island developing states of the Pacific. So let me first just dive in and get into the subject. I'm going to talk mostly about the transformation of agricultural food systems. Uh, now, as we know, over the last uh, four or five decades, a production-oriented approach to increasing food production has served us very well. And those of us uh, who are in the same group, age group as I am, uh, we were all, we all grew up in countries which were largely food insecure and probably even food scarce. But thanks to the policies that, um, adopted at that time, which led to increased production of most of the staples, we all benefited from that food security and the food security then drove the robust economic growth, which we have seen in the Asian Pacific region over the last 
two or three decades. It has pretty much been the engine of the world in terms of GDP growth and in terms of the number of people it has pulled out of poverty. So, and all this is primarily because there was enough food for everyone as the population grew through the years. However, this has been accompanied by certain issues which we are beginning to recognize and which were over the last couple of decades. The first, of course, is because of the production-oriented approach, the pressure on everybody to keep on increasing production every year. The, there was an increased use, or there is an increased use of chemicals and other chemical-based uh, agents, and that's what leads to pollution and land degradation. Those are not the only reasons, but those are one of them. And then you also have rapid urbanization in the Asian Pacific, which has resulted in lesser land now being available for food production and for agriculture in general. On top of that, the uh, emphasis on production has resulted in emphasis on a few staples, and therefore our food is based on a very narrow, diverse base. A few cereals, a few pulses, some oils, some fruits and vegetables. But the vast diversity which, is, which was present in the indigenous food systems of our time is now has been lost or is, con is continuously being lost. And all this is then exacerbated by the human driven climate change, which we all are familiar with. And we are all familiar with the, uh, with the fact that the IPCC's latest report says that the temperature increase needs to be kept down below one and a half degrees by 2030. And that includes agriculture, which needs to make its own contribution towards that. So when you look at the whole picture, you actually begin to see that our food security is a bit dodgy and we definitely are off track to the SDGs by 2030. And one and some of these things will come up again in a week's time when on the sidelines of the HLPF, FAO will be launching the global flagship report on food security and nutrition. And I'm pretty sure that the numbers will not be very encouraging. So what we have right now with our current food system is that there is widespread malnourishment, particularly in the Asian Pacific, where you see undernutrition, you see micronutrient deficiency, and you see obesity and overweight. And calories are cheap. So any you can go to any shop and you can buy a food which is rich in fat, sugar, and salt for really uh, very little. But if you want to buy fruits and vegetables, or even if you want to buy bananas, you actually start to count the cost. So nutrients are costly. So this is a paradox in a, in a, a continent or in a region, which amongst its members counts the topmost producers of rice, topmost producers of pork, of fish, of pulses, of oil seeds, of so many other things. And yet we actually have the situation where the cost of a healthy diet in the Asian region is now approaching $4 per person a day, which is barely affordable even to those who actually earn a decent living, let alone those who are actually below the poverty line and earning less than $2 a day. So that's where we are. That's, that's the problem with our current food system. And it has also shown itself to be extremely susceptible to shocks. We saw what happened with COVID-19 continues. We now have the food and fuel crisis because of the conflict in Europe. Apart from these, we have climate events repeatedly in the Asia-Pacific region. We have insect pest attacks, both for plants as well as for animals. So we have plant diseases such as the fall RV worm, the desert locust. We also have the African swine fever and the lumpy disease in animals. So we are now also left with scarce and natural resources because, as we said, because of urbanization, loss of urban land, land degradation, and all this results in uncertain livelihoods for millions of smallholders and family farmers in the region. In other words, we have a food system which does not have any resilience. It cannot recover easily from shocks, and, uh, and, as, uh, and that's where we are at constantly in this, uh, countries and economies are constantly in this um, uh, dilemma on how to react when such situations occur, which you are seeing right now, for instance, there are export restrictions being put in place and other measures that governments are taking uh, to deal with these shocks right now. So the answer is actually to refashion, to reimagine and to reshape these agri-food systems and make them efficient, inclusive, resilient and sustainable. 
And there are four elements that we need to keep in mind all the time. And this is where the complexity and the difficult conversation actually begins. So the first is the societal elements. So all of us are involved uh, without exception. And when there are people involved and countries involved, there are policies, laws, and behavior involved. So every country has its own view on what they want to do in terms of transforming their food system, what they want to produce, what should, their, what should all the citizens be eating, how do we distribute the food, who's vulnerable and who's not, and so on and so forth. Then we have the natural elements, which are limited because we can already see evidence of water scarcity. Land is already very scarce. The climate is changing and there are ecosystems, there is ecosystem damage because of many factors apart from uh, just the chemicals and agriculture. Then all the interaction between the societal and the natural elements is actually leads to agriculture and food production. And even as we are discussing today, the nature of production of what it is being produced and how is it being produced and how food is processed and consumed is changing. In rapidly urbanizing Asia, more and more, there's more and more dependence on processed food and less on unprocessed food. And that processed food has its own nutritional issues. That also leads to an effect on the livelihoods of the people dependent on agriculture, because there's also now a trend for food being produced in laboratories, in factories. There's urban agriculture, which is beginning to grow. And so there are many uh, factors here in play. And then there are the trade-offs, the so cost-benefit analysis. So if we take a certain step, for instance, if a country wants to have a policy where it wants to reduce its cereal production, what's the effect on smallholders? Do their incomes go down? What's the effect on trade if the country is a major exporter of cereals? So what is the cost benefit analysis? This is a trade-off that countries need to keep, uh, keep to, uh, need to analyze as they begin to bring about this change. Important thing to realize that there will be winners and losers. And those who lose out in the process need support. So they need social safety nets, social protection measures, so that they can adapt to a changing situation and build, rebuild their skills and build their livelihoods once again. So it's no more business than usual. Our agri-food systems need to produce enough food for more than 5 billion people by 2050. The food must be safe and nutritious. It must be produced using fewer natural resources therefore have a reduced carbon footprint and it must provide decent livelihoods and incomes to the smallholders and family farmers and it must be shock proof and resilient. So if we want to tick all these boxes, we need to talk to all the stakeholders involved and that's what the UN Food System Summit last year was all about. There were a number of dialogues preceding that in each country and the, each or all the stakeholders across the board participated. In some cases, they didn't. In some cases, they did. So that conversation has to continue. It does not end with the summit itself. So the summit came up with these five key points on nourishing all people. That's about nutrition, boosting nature-based solutions to, to reduce the use of chemicals and use more, more eco-friendly methods of production, processing, and consumption, making it more sustainable effectively. Advancing equitable livelihoods, ensuring decent work and incomes for all those who are involved, building resilience and, um, and, and resistance to shocks, and accelerating this means of implementation. So just to give you a very quickly run you through a couple of examples, uh, Bangladesh was not very long ago a food insecure country. They first became secure in rice, and then now are slowly beginning to become secure in the other uh, food that the citizens consume. And they have, uh, over a period of time, starting with a food policy which focuses exclusively on food security, that has morphed and transitioned through a series of technical assistance programs into a plan of action which also uh, is about nutrition and also about sustainable and efficient agri-food systems. And to do that, they have modified their institutions or set up new ones, such as a food planning and monitoring unit, a food safety authority, a national nutrition council, all of which work together to ensure that an agri-food system approach is being implemented and that all these checks and balances or rather all the trade-offs that we're talking about are actually analyzed well. And then the, that's how the country then becomes healthier and also more
Uh, no, I sorry, think... uh, did I lose you? We, uh, we lost you just briefly. Okay, D did you hear Bangladesh? Yes, we did, yeah. Okay, so I can quickly finish from here. No so uh, the other example, I want to quickly go through. So I covered Bangladesh for you. The other example is Philippine increase agrobiodiversity in rice. Rice, as you would all know, is very important for the Philippines. So there are uh, there are ways and means in which to bring back the older varieties, the more resistant varieties, the more climate climate adapted varieties back into the mainstream and that's being done through community approaches and community seed banks. So communities do this and it's not an institution or an international institution like ours which is doing it. So these are, I'm just giving you a couple of examples just to give you a flavor on what food system transformation looks like. So what are we doing now? So we work here, we are working here in, in the region, Asia Pacific region, assisting countries to develop transformation plans changing or trying to advise on what kind of policies and planning architecture they should have. Continuing the dialogues, the food system dialogues, because this is not the end, this is only the beginning. And very important to understand one size, one plan does not fit everybody. It needs to be contextualized to every country. And then analyzing the risks of the various changes. So if we advise a country that you change a cropping pattern, what happens to farmers' incomes? What happens to their production? How do they balance all the needs that they have? Do they produce less of staples, more of fruits and vegetables, which is a healthier combination, but is it economically the smartest thing to do or environmentally? So these are questions we are. Likewise, the issues around technology. Um, do the, do, will there be a loss of jobs because of digitalization and other technologies? How do we handle that? How there is a large scale migration of especially of males to the cities. So mechanization needs to be more gender friendly. So we need to focus more on women. And I think that's what um, the previous speakers also talked about. If you reduce uh, overconsumption, reduce food loss and waste, it affects smallholder incomes. So again, how do we balance? What kind of safety nets do we have for smallholders? So all these issues are constantly coming up and there are far more than what I've actually listed here. But here's where the UN Coordination Hub, which is now the Secretariat for the, or the Permanent Secretariat for the Food Systems, has now been set up in FAO headquarters in Rome. And through them, we channel all these advice to countries in the region. So I'll just stop here and just to say that overall agri-food systems need to have contribute to all four objectives at the same time, better production, better nutrition, better environment, and better lives and not just to one. And that's the point we're trying to make here in systems transformation. Thank you and back to you, David. Thank you so much, uh, Sridhar. Um, uh, really a great presentation there. I, um, you know, illustrating both the challenges um, that, that countries are up against in terms of uh, their food systems, but also um, sharing, um, uh, you know, some of the outcomes from the, the food summit, uh, as well as how countries can can sort of transform their their food systems, I guess, to more sustainable uh, ways. Um, please do share that the the FAO's um, flagship report with us, and and we'd be also happy to to promote that on our you know social media channels, but also share it uh, in particular with uh, our journalist uh, network as well. So thanks so much. Um, so I'm going to turn now to uh, our next speaker. Um, uh, who will address uh, the topic of, on enhancing inter international trade? Uh, Alexei Kravchenko. Uh, he's uh, Alexei is an economic affairs officer with the UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. Uh, Eska, over to you, uh, Alexei. Hello, uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Thank you for having me here. I hope you can see uh, my screen right now. Yep, right, we can. Great. Uh, so uh, without further ado, let me just quickly go through this topic of enhancing international trade for the least developed countries. Uh, but first, uh, let me just quickly give you an introduction about ESCAP itself. So ESCAP, the United Nations uh, Economic and Social Commissions for Asia and the Pacific, located in Bangkok, is a regional arm of uh, UN Secretariat, uh, ECOSOC, the uh, 
Economic and Social Commission. Uh, we have 53 uh, member states and nine associate uh, member states spanning from uh, Turkey all the way to the remote islands in the Pacific. Um, so what is that, uh, that um, SCAP does? Well, it's uh, uh, basically, it's, uh, it's a, it serves as a common voice for the uh, Asia Pacific on the development. It, uh, it's a forum for countries in the, uh, in the region to discuss, uh, develop common solutions to developing the challenges and promote regional cooperation. Uh, we are also a think tank, so we do research uh, studies and analysis on economic, social, environmental issues uh, for the benefit of our member states. And uh, finally, we uh, provide uh, good developmental practices, uh, knowledge sharing, capacity building. So capacity building basically means uh, uh, trainings in terms of workshops, seminars, and uh, expert uh, group meetings. Within ASCAP, we have uh, uh, three pillars, the environmental, economic, and environmental pillars, uh, and they have uh, within them eight substantive divisions, uh, energy stats, blah, 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 all the way to trade investment and uh, innovation, which is uh, where I'm from. So the trade investments and innovations division's objective is to strengthen trade investment, uh, enterprise development, technology, and innovation for sustainable development, <clears throat> sorry, uh, in Asia and the Pacific. Within this division, we have uh, three subsections, um, trade policy, investment, and innovation. And I sit within the trade policy and facilitation section here. <clears throat> So, um, uh, as, as mentioned, ASCAP uh, overall primarily does three things, which is, uh, you know, serves as a place, a forum for uh, government officials to come and discuss and uh, make treaties, uh, cooperate. Uh, we also do policy advice and we do trainings. So let me show you some of the examples of the things that we do here in Trade Division. Our flagship publication, is this uh, Asia Pacific Trade and Investment Report, which we publish every two years. And um, <clears throat> last year, it had a theme topic of accelerating climate smart trade and investment for sustainable development. Um, so what, what, what's the relationship between trade and investment on uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, which was uh, the focus of this report? Well, first of all, um, trade directly uh, contributes to emissions due to transportations and uh, actual trade procedures. So the more uh, trade there is, there's going to be more uh, emissions. Uh, trade also uh, leads to greater economic activities and even further increasing emissions. Uh, but at the same time, uh, trade-related uh, regulations can be favorable to climate actions. So, for example, if you're going to sign a free trade agreement uh, with the EU or the United States, <clears throat> there may be some climate-related provisions in the trade agreements uh, uh, in, in those uh, agreements, right? Uh, at the same time, uh, some countries in the region uh, uh, are actually trying to reduce the environmental regulations to try to attract some investment, so it can go either way. Um, depending on the country-specific uh, production process, can uh, trade can lead to either decreased or increased emissions. For example, if you consider the United Kingdom, even uh, accounting for all the emissions from transport, New Zealand lamb actually contributes to four times fewer emissions than the UK lamb, mostly because of the production process where New Zealand's uh, sheep graze outside the whole year. Uh, but in the UK, they're sort of uh, in the barns half of the time, they need brought in feed and heat, and they actually contribute to more emissions. And <clears throat> finally, and perhaps most importantly, trade is crucial for spread of green technologies uh, to attain the green economies of scales and to reduce the emissions. So as part of this report, as I said, we provide recommendations and I'm not gonna go through uh, all of them now, but we did the stock taking and realized that, uh, that uh, there's, there's a lot of room for countries to improve, to make their trade investment climate smart. So some of the recommendations include a liberalized trade in the climate smart uh, trade uh, 
goods and services that I mentioned. These things range from, um, you know, uh, the, 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 propel, the, the blades for uh, uh, wind turbines, the solar panels and green technologies. And we found that the, the, the tariffs that these products save, these climate smart goods are actually higher than uh, tariffs that uh, coal faces. So, you know, when you're trying to transition to a green economy, uh, it, it's a bit hip hypocritical to try to promote the Paris Agreement while you're actually taxing the goods more than the, uh, the, the, the coal and oil. Uh, another thing is that uh, countries need to start phasing out fossil fuels. So uh, the economies in Asia Pacific spent more than $175 billion in fossil fuels in 2019. Uh, it's probably going to go up this year as well. Uh, you, you see this uh, strange uh, way of this curve, uh, you, almost if there's been a dip in 2016. Uh, well, this is actually just because the price of oil has been lower in that particular year. Uh, as we know now, the price of oil is going up. Uh, so are the subsidies in the region and uh, countries are no longer able to afford them. Pakistan is trying to withdraw them altogether. Uh, Sri Lanka ran out of foreign reserves to start with. Um, and uh, in Thailand, they're having to raise the diesel prices because the fossil fuel subsidies are very expensive. So there are very inefficient ways of trying to support the economy, trying to support the, uh, the poor people. So what we advise is to remove those and substitute them with more direct social policies, such as uh, direct cash transfers. Uh, last but not least, we also uh, recommend uh, countries to streamline their trade facilitation. And one of these ways is to join uh, the framework agreement on facilitation of cross-border paperless trade in the Asian Pacific. Uh, so it's a uh, newest uh, UN treaty to facilitate trade uh, fac uh, facilitation. It's been uh, signed or acceded to by at least nine member states, including Bangladesh. Uh, it can save up to $6 billion uh, annually. And I invite countries uh, that are not part of it to consider joining it. I think the last one was actually Timor-Leste. Uh, in other um, uh, LDCs from the region. Now, um, I wanted to also mention to you, uh, Tina, this is a capacity building or training uh, tool that I mentioned about uh, in context of LDC graduation. So uh, graduation is a milestone, a key milestone for countries uh, signifying a tremendous progress achieved in, in its economic and social development. Uh, so the, the problem, however, is that uh, when LDC happens, it, uh, there'll be gradual removal of support uh, from other countries, including trade-related measures such as preferential tariffs. So you have uh, countries like uh, economies like the United States, uh, the European Union, China, India, all providing uh, preferential access to um, LDC countries. And when these LDC countries graduate, this uh, preference is being withdrawn. So uh, to substitute for those countries need to negotiate trade agreements, right? Uh, for example, Bangladesh needs to evaluate what would happen after they graduate and they don't longer have the same access anymore. And so they have to sign a trade agreement. And it, part of this um, uh, implies negotiating these trade agreements. Uh, so I just wanted to show really quick this uh, video of the tool that we made and it's called uh, TINA. Kia ora. Uh, currently, our member states are involved in nearly 200 trade agreements with many more being negotiated. However, developing countries often lack the necessary analytical skills and resources to prepare well for trade agreement negotiations and need help. SCAP has been asked many times to assist with impact assessment studies. Such analytical studies typically take months to carry out and require specialized knowledge and significant financial resources. It meant that ASCAP could at most help one or two countries at a time and that countries with limited resources faced a clear disadvantage in preparing for negotiations. As such, the underlying idea behind TINA was to automate many of the tasks involved in preparing for negotiations 
so the time and financial savings could be spent more productively elsewhere. And all member states, particularly countries with special needs, could benefit. Ever since we showcased the first version of TINA, the response has always been unanimous. Oh, how I wish TINA was there when I was working on such and such trade agreement. Indeed, TINA has since helped the governments of Bangladesh and Cambodia, and tomorrow I'm conducting a training for the government of Vanuatu. During our last committee, five member states expressed appreciation to ask for TINA and urged us to keep on working on it. This was a total, albeit a very pleasant surprise to us. Now, TINA is not just a website that presents data. It is a sophisticated piece of analytical software that we developed from scratch, and then you can access online for free. It carries out complex calculations that use millions of pieces of information from multiple sources, analyzes text of trade agreements, and much more. The work that previously took months to do by expensive consultants can now be freely obtained in mere minutes. The development of TINA was only possible because of the in-house forward-looking and innovation-friendly leadership combined with trade negotiating, economic, and programming expertise. But we're not stopping here. We're in talks with the ILO to include modules in TINA to ensure that the most vulnerable are not left behind in trade negotiations. We want to encourage the use of provisions to address climate change. We want to make certain that during the next pandemic, there'll be trade provisions to ensure equitable access to medical supplies. As such, we want TINA not just to save time and money. We want to leverage TINA as an inclusive platform to guide the region's new generation of trade agreements to contribute positively towards sustainable development, ensuring all countries get their fair share of benefits offered from future trade deals. Thank you, Tanako. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, that would be me happy to uh, answer any questions about any of this. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alexei. Um, and yeah, also sharing uh, sharing with us Tina. Um, it's it's it looks like a, a really fantastic um, tool. Um, and and yeah, I'm sure that you know we would also be happy to share this. Um, it's it's the first time I've heard of it. Uh, um, so yeah, please do share, and and you know we can also share it with um, the carbon emissions for for the other space here in the world. Uh, so it will be thank you. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, to, to use this tool. Um, so um, unfortunately, um, we we could not secure our final speaker uh, due to conflicts in their schedules. Um, but I did want to just touch um, uh, briefly on this topic of of regulation. Uh, in, in fact, Alexi has also kind of started on it, uh, so it's a, it's a good segue, so to speak. Um, there are currently 46 LDCs, and, and uh, some of them are, are set to leave, or, or so, so to graduate, so to speak, uh, can't very soon. Um, and, and certainly one of the most important, um, if, if not the most important goals for, for the least, for least developed countries, is to be in a position to graduate out of the category of LDCs. Um, and this means uh, meeting three specific criteria on gross national income, uh, also on uh, human capital, uh, which includes indicators of, for instance, under five mortality rate, uh, maternal mortality ratio, uh, as, as well as secondary school enrollment. Uh, and then also um, indicators on economic and environmental vulnerability. Um, and it's really clear that you know, the LDCs cannot do it alone. Um, they need to point as partnerships uh, with development partners, with the private sector, uh, also with civil society, uh, with the UN. Um, and, and thanks to colleagues who've just shared uh, you know, a, a good uh, examples of those partnerships, uh, but also partnerships with international financial institutions. Um, the, the LDCs do receive uh, specific support in terms of across trade, uh, financial and technical assistance, uh, as well as support to participate in, in international forums. Uh, and as more gra countries are approaching graduation, um, there has been this increasing emphasis on securing uh, support for so-called smooth transition out of the category. Um, the category uh, gra graduation itself does take several years. Uh, which um, in, allows countries to prepare for so-called smooth transition. Um, and 
the UN does provide, uh, as well as other partners, uh, support to countries um, uh, with analysis and capacity building, uh, as we, uh, we just heard from Alexis' example of Tina. Um, and I just want to mention here that um, when we look specifically at the Doha program of action, um, the aim is to expand uh, the resources that least developed countries have access to, uh, and also to incentivize uh, additional financial uh, financing and investments. Um, there are specific targets under the Doha Program of Action in terms of mobilizing uh, international solidarity and partnerships, um, and, and, and sort of really getting countries and LDCs into a place where they can they can be in a position to graduate. Uh, so there's indicators, for example, on in increasing tax revenue as a proportion of GDP. Uh, this is under the Doha program of action, increasing tax revenue as a proportion of GP to at least 15% uh, in all LDCs. Uh, also, the need to fulfill uh, official development assistance and commitments to the least developed countries uh, under the program of action. Um, uh, it, it encourages ODA providers to make available at least 0.2% of their gross national income to the least developed countries. Uh, and then also the, there are indicators there on supporting LDCs to be in a better position to attract uh, foreign direct investments. Uh, and then also finally, um, an important target is to enable 15 additional least developed countries to meet the criteria for graduation by 2031. Um, the countries that are currently on track to graduate include Angola uh, in 2024, Bangladesh in 2026, Bhutan in 2023, uh, Laos in 2026, as well as Nepal, and then also Sao Tome and Principe in 2024, and similarly, uh, Solomon Islands in 2024. Um, and, and just a final point on this, um, the, the UN works really uh, um, together through, uh, through an uh, an interagency task force on graduation. Uh, it's a task force that's chaired by uh, my office. Uh, and this task force is working very closely with uh, the resident coordinators offices uh, across the, the UN country teams at the country level, uh, as well as international financial institutions uh, operating in, in the country. So I just wanna, you know, I didn't wanna leave that, that final um, uh, topic sort of uh, untouched. Um, but I think it's now time to uh, turn over to our Q&A session. I'm sure we'll, um, we have a couple of questions that came in through the chat, um, but do put up your hands um, and we will give you the mic to answer, uh, to ask the questions of panelists. Uh, please do introduce yourself uh, as well as uh, the, the media ag agency that you're with. And I do, I, I do apologize because I, I've skipped, uh, I've, I've jumped over from uh, Alexi straight to topic six, but um, we have also um, uh, my colleague Matsomi uh, Malekchani, my apologies uh, for skipping over you there um, to address, uh, to speak on the topic of climate change uh, as well as building resilience to future shocks. Um, Monsomi is uh, the team lead for the LDC's expert group uh, and national adaptation plan units uh, under um, the adaptation division of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. But Monsomi, are you there? Hello. Yes, Monsomi. Hi, Damien. We can hear you. Yes, you can hear me? Yes. All right. Um, thank you very much. And uh, greetings to everybody from Bonn. Um, I'm Mutsumi Malichanis. You introduced me. Uh, I lead the, the work uh, at the Secretariat on Support 
to the least developed countries. And I will share with you a little bit on what we are doing in the UN climate change uh, in supporting the LDCs, uh, primarily on adaptation to climate change, uh, but also broadly on climate change uh, as well. Um, just to mention that support to the LDCs under the UNFCCC is a long institutionalized uh, mechanism. Um, the convention itself, since 1992, when it was written out, we have an article that provides provision for the parties to take into account the full uh, specific needs and special situations of the LDCs. Um, and everybody that would be in this call would know why this is so because uh, of the special circumstances uh, of the LDCs and the vulnerabilities that they face uh, in, in, uh, in addition to everybody else. Um, so just straight ahead in terms of what we have under the UNFCCC, uh, we do have a dedicated work program that supports the LDCs uh, in strengthening the institutional base in the LDCs, their engagement in the negotiation process, um, in adaptation planning and implementation, um, uh, which I will talk a little bit more about um, in preparation of um, uh, documents or at least their offers for the LDCs on how they will act on climate change, adaptation technologies, et cetera. So in addition to this work program, which literally brings together the holistic support to the LDCs under the UN of CCC, uh, there's also dedicated financial support. Uh, we have an LDC fund uh, that supports the LDCs uh, on implementing the LDC work program. Uh, currently, currencies can now access up to 50 million US dollars uh, since the, uh, the fund was established in 2001. Uh, we also have uh, the largest climate fund, the Green Climate Fund, under which the specific considerations for the LDCs, small island developing states and African states. Um, in addition to the funding, uh, which also some this package provides what we call a good practice system in supporting the countries to have a work program that's dedicated, to have the funding dedicated for that, as well as technical support. We have an LDC expert group, uh, that is, is dedicated to providing technical guidance and support to the LDCs in implementing the work program and many other things. Uh, on our mechanisms, for instance, and our technology mechanism, we do have an incubator program that supports the LDCs in developing technology roadmaps and accessing funding related to adaptation technologies. Um, and the other part that we have under the LDC, under the UNFCCC, in recognition of the limited capacities of the LDCs. Uh, is the flexibility in the provisions for reporting. Uh, there's a lot of reporting that goes along with actions of parties under the UNFCCC, but there's flexibility for the LDCs uh, in terms of also how they contribute to the budget of the, uh, the organization. Um, just a snapshot in terms of what we're looking at over the 20 years that we've been supporting the LDCs. Uh, this is with regard to adaptation, specifically what we call the National Adaptation Programs of Action. Uh, each LDC at least has been assisted to prepare one, uh, and what LDCs can actually be regarded as the pioneers of climate change adaptation. Uh, whereas it has caught up uh, momentum in many of the countries, it was first in the LDCs where adaptation to climate change was primarily spread out, um, and also programming of adaptation projects in terms of how to deal with the climate risks and impacts. Uh, the LDCs have had the benefit of doing this much more. But of course, there are a lot of challenges that remain with these. It doesn't mean that because they are the pioneers, then everything is all well with the LDCs. Um, and in fact, some of the lessons that I will just highlight a few uh, is that adaptation, of course, remains a critical element for the LDCs uh, because they house the poorest and most vulnerable societies. And they do not have the uh, structures or strong institutions that would help them deal uh, dynamically uh, and uh, with agility to climate shocks. And and the climate action in itself remains limited for obvious reasons. There's the capacity issues, but also there are other systemic issues uh, that face the LDCs. And, and in fact, our latest uh, start, uh, evaluations that were done under our biggest fund that I'm telling you about, the Green Climate Fund, found that there's little evidence of climate uh, of access to the extent which uh, implementation of adaptation is taking place in the LDCs, which is one of the biggest uh, challenges that we are facing now and trying to see how we can address that. Um, some of the good things that, are, um, uh, that we have learned so far is that for the LDCs, because of the limited capacities and the special circumstances, the clarity in terms of the guidelines and procedures for accessing support are key to make sure that the governments understand how they can access the different support. 
A dedicated work program funding and technical support is also an important element. Uh, there's also a good question on capacity building, which everybody else speaks about, which I think for the LDCs, what we have learned is that it's an ongoing process. There will never be a time when we have, we have built the capacity in the LDCs and it's enough and LDCs can do things on their own. Uh, so there's always that element of having to do additional support and additional uh, efforts in supporting the LDCs beyond just the mere capacity building activities and efforts that we are used to. Uh, which brings me to a picture that we have in terms of how the access to the climate fund that we have now that I was talking about is the Green Climate Fund. Um, a good number of the LDCs are yet to access significant amounts of funding. Uh, of course, funding is one of the indicators that you would say indicates to what extent this country implementing measures on climate change. A lot of them have yet to access even beyond the 50 million US dollars in implementing adaptation actions. But of course, you can see there are just a few, Bangladesh, Ethiopia, Tanzania, a few of the LDCs that have been able to access slightly significant amounts of funding to be able to implement their measures on climate change. But for a majority of the LDCs, this remains a challenge. And this is, comes to the point that I was raising that for the LDCs, one of the big lessons ourselves we've learned is that dedicated support measures that go beyond uh, a mere capacity building is a key thing, is a key instrument to making sure that uh, they make progress. So on my two slides, I'll talk about a little bit of on the vision in terms of how we envision the support uh, being like uh, in terms of supporting the LDCs. Um, uh, the one thing that is important is that we want to focus on the outcomes uh, because in terms of implementing all the capacity building, the efforts, the funding, technical support, at the end of the day, we want to see uh, the LDCs with a strong adaptive capacity, with the strengthened the resilience, uh, and with reduced vulnerability to climate change in the LDCs. And for them to arrive at that, of course, we do need to have uh, plans to do that. We just need to be able to be implementing priority adaptation actions uh, to do that. And, and in addition to that, to support the whole of that system, then we need to have well-structured adaptation planning processes. Uh, and this is the vision that we are having as our high, at our hindsight to guide our efforts in supporting the LDCs. I have here on my slide the number of uh, efforts and initiatives that we have. I'll speak about the two yellow that I highlighted uh, because all the others, of course, are part of the bigger picture in terms of how we support the LDCs. Uh, so the first one is the Open Up Initiative, uh, which recognizes that the UN system plus a lot of other partners and players, regional centers and networks, and of course, even my colleagues that have just spoke in this call, uh, there's a lot of support that is available for the LDCs. Uh, the, uh, the, the important part is how do we draw upon all that capacity and channel it to be able to support the LDCs? So through this open up initiative, it's a, a crowdsourcing type of modality where we engage everyone that is able to offer something to support the LDCs, it be tools, it be data, it be funding. Uh, we mobilize that support to target it to specific countries uh, to be able to prepare their plans, uh, to be able to implement adaptation actions. Because at the end of the day, what we are looking for uh, is resilient societies. We want to see the communities in the LDCs benefiting. How do we get there? So this is the key element of this Open Lab initiative. Uh, drawing upon whatever efforts exist. Uh, and then we have the UN for NAPS uh, initiative, which is led by the climate change secretariat, which is led by us directly, where we recognize that also through the uh, program of action for the LDCs actually, which also brings in and draws upon the UN system support to the LDCs. There's adequate mandates for UN support to the LDCs uh, within the UN system. And there's a lot of capabilities and capacity uh, so we bring together all the UN system entities uh, to be able to offer directed support to the LDCs upon demand or upon request. Uh, and this initiative we, is now two years down the line and we are continuing to grow it uh, to bring together all that capacities and capabilities in the UN system uh, to see how we can uh, enhance our efforts, enhance maybe achieve even better the goals that we now have under the Doha program for action for the LDCs. So Damien, thanks very much for this. I'll be happy to share this slide. Uh, unfortunately, we, we didn't get the invitation for the African part, but of course, uh, I would be happy if also these slides can be shared for that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Matsomi. Uh, and apologies again for, for skipping your word over you there. Um, 
and thanks for sharing uh, the work that you do. Um, you know, you mentioned access to, to you know, capacity building, uh, but also finance. I think it's it's such a critical area for for LDCs. Um, but I, I think you're also hinting there at sort of how you know, LDCs have been paving the way as well uh, for for climate action uh, all around the world. That uh, in, in many ways, a lot of countries are also sort of you know, riding on the coattails of LDCs. Uh, so thanks for sharing that, uh, as well as the UN system support uh, for for LDCs. Um, so uh, with that, uh, um, we are running a bit over time. We did start a bit late, um, but I, I do want to give uh, a moment to uh, the participants who are online uh, to ask questions. Um, you can put your hand up, uh, and we'll we'll have, we'll kind of give you the mic. Uh, so again, if you can just int introduce yourself. Uh, as well as the uh, agency that you're with. Um, my, I have a call. My colleague Sunari is also uh, going to have. Uh, hello. 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 Yes, we can hear you, uh, Mohammed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, good morning from Dhaka. I am Refet uh, from the Daily Star. I'm a senior staff reporter for the Daily Star. Uh, can you hear me, please? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, unfortunately, sorry for my uh, joining late because there was a technical problem in my uh, uh, devices. So it's a bit late. Um, I have uh, one particular question uh, to you uh, because uh, uh, there is the recently concluded WTO uh, meeting, NC12, uh, has taken some decision regarding LDCs. Suppose uh, many LDCs are going to be graduated, including Bangladesh, very soon. Uh, maybe uh, uh, Bangladesh is going to be graduated in November 24, 2026. And uh, maybe uh, in next one, one uh, decade or next uh, five to six years, 16 more LDCs are going to be graduated. So there is a question uh, from the leaders of the world uh, that this question was raised also in the WTO meeting, MC12, in Geneva, I was there. Uh, that is there any need for uh, LDC group in future? Because almost all LDCs are going to be graduated to a developing country within next uh, 15 years or 16 years. So what will happen uh, if those countries are graduated to developing countries? Um, do you have? Do you think that there should have a specific plan of action for graduating LDCs so that they can become higher income countries in future. Uh, because uh, after the graduation of all LDCs, currently 46 countries as LDCs, so they will be graduated. They, this group will not exist anymore in UN system. Then do you think that the the, 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 the trade facilities the LDCs are enjoying now should be replicated for the graduating LDCs? This is my particular question. And another question that, uh, uh, do you think that the trade facilities the, that those the LDCs are enjoying now should be given the graduating LDCs? Because the, there was a big uh, debate in MC12 that the LDCs should be extended, LDCs trade benefits should be extended to the graduating LDCs. LDCs. I can say particularly Bangladesh was uh, lobbying with the WTO platforms so that the LDC trade benefit is extended to Bangladesh and also to other LDCs, graduating LDCs, even after the graduation. Do you think it is a good idea or it is a viable for uh, the countries like Bangladesh. Thank you so much. 
Thanks so much, uh, Mohammed. I think we're going to take uh, maybe one or two more questions, if there are others. Hello. So I see a couple of hands up. Yeah. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, hi, I'm Sonam Lama. Uh, a climate journalist from Nepal. Actually, I've also uh, typed my question in Q&A, but I think it's not accessible uh, for some reason. Anyways, my question is uh, because we are living in um, uh, low-income countries, so it's very important to take account, take into account that climate change has its um, multifaceted consequences in least developed countries. Like for example, um, that there are disasters for sure, but it is also impacting the way we eat and think, like for example, in Jamot and rural area parts of Nepal, uh, we have child marriages, which is a worsening, which is exacerbating because of, uh, uh, like because of droughts, um, um, because of droughts and um, lack of water sources, or you know, because they are not able to go to schools, the children are not able to go to schools, so the rate of climate uh, child marriage is increasing in that sense. So. Uh, so the, the, the question is, what are the mechanisms do, can we ad, ad, adapt to uh, mitigate such consequences of climate change, which are such untoward in situations where there is no access to food and basic rights and uh, where people are really um, uh, impoverished and they, are, they don't have access to um, uh, a lot of resources. So climate change is, change is already worsening there. So what are the mechanisms that we can adopt to um, mitigate this untoward impacts of um, changing climate? That's that's the question. Okay, thank you, Sonam. And um, I think we have, we'll take one more and then we can turn to the panel uh, for, for any responses. So Nara, did you, um, did we get a couple more hands up? Um, everyone with their hands up is currently unmuted, so anyone can speak. Okay, um, uh, can I ask a question? Yep, yeah, go ahead, uh, Mahavir. Yeah, uh, hello, my name is Mahavir Powdell. Uh, I'm from Kathmandu. <clears throat> uh, my question is related to uh, this graduation process. Nepal is, set to graduate in 2026 uh, this was like it, it was supposed to graduate in uh, 2018 but then nepal said because of earthquake and and you know border blockade so we couldn't make it so this time around also as nepal is set to graduate in 2026 uh, we have different kind of economic crisis looming in, you know, the global recession and then uh, COVID-19 pandemic and all this. So can there be a possibility for Nepal or like for, for uh, LDC system to defer this graduation process just in case Nepal says, sorry, we can't make it in 2026 once again. Uh, so that's my question. Okay, thank you, um, Mahabir, for that question. Uh, I think I'm going to turn to the panel. Um, so just maybe just a quick recap. Um, we had a question from uh, Mohammed uh, in relation to uh, Bangladesh's graduation. Uh, and essentially, um, if I got this correctly, will there, will there be a plan of action for LDCs after they graduate? Um, uh, essentially, when the, the, when the group uh, no longer exists. Uh, and, and should there be trade support that continue to be provided um, to LDCs uh, after graduation? Um, then we got a question from Sonam um, in relation to climate change uh, and, and in terms of how uh, some of the, the 
the untoward impact, so to speak, uh, of climate change. Um, she referred to, for instance, uh, child marriages uh, increasing. Uh, and so, and then, you know, what kind of mechanisms uh, can we put in place to address this? And then uh, another question on graduation from Mahabir, uh, this time in relation to um, Nepal. Uh, in essence, uh, the question is, um, can there can there be a possibility for for Nepal to postpone uh, graduation, um, given uh, given crisis, the you know multiple crises that countries are facing at the moment? Um, so I see uh, I see Rio Santos and also Sridhar. Uh, if you want to, uh, maybe I'll, we'll go to Rio first. Um. Thank you. Uh, I would just like to quickly answer the questions on regarding the effect of climate change and um, and how how UN is actually addressing it. Uh, particularly, uh, for example, in uh, for AI uh, for ITU, uh, we believe that climate change is really. I mean, we are now experiencing uh, climate change. You know? um, in fact. I'm coming from the Philippines, uh, where when God created the world, mm -hmm. we receive all That's the true. we receive all the disasters that uh, the world can offer, and uh, we have more disaster than the and because of that, we are trying to adjust in this kind of situation, and in fact, technology now can 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 provide solutions somehow in terms of the issue of food security. For example, we now call, we, we, we have a technology now called uh, precision agriculture, uh, where we use uh, artificial intelligence to predict uh, the soil situation, the production capability, in, and by, by utilizing the land uh, in a more uh, uh, smarter way in ensuring that the food becomes available. Um, uh, this is this is now being used and being integrated to the e agriculture plan, uh, basically allowing that we can predict uh, uh, we can predict how many supply and what what food can be developed and the situation of the soil, the weather, etc. All of this connected into a one system that allows us to connect where this food can be sourced and delivered accordingly. Of course, this is not this is not the full answer on climate change, but basically this is uh, this is one solution to address uh, and do uh, uh, agriculture in a better and smart way. Second, um, one of the key challenge during the time of disaster is the availability of connection and uh, uh, connectivity. And uh, that's why we are always promoting ICT uh, uh, resiliency and uh, ensure that it can actually, uh, people can connect during the time of disaster. And at the same time, through the use of technology, IOM and other UN agencies are also using drone technology to deliver uh, services or relief to other countries or, or communities affected by disasters because of climate change. Uh, finally, um, leveraging technology and innovation as well. Um, there are plenty of solutions uh, available uh, in addressing several challenges, but at the same time, it also creating new challenges as well. Uh, the issue of e-waste, uh, which is becoming a big issue where, um, where gadgets and old uh, uh, equipments, IT equipment is becoming also a problem in terms of where we are throwing it and how we are managing this. ITU with the, with the assistance of, uh, in partnership with uh, UNEP is also trying to address uh, creating a, uh, a circular economic process in addressing the issue of e-waste. So um, I will provide the website of ITU that can provide more detailed information about it. But um, uh, what I would like to emphasize is there are some 
at solutions available through the use of technology. However, um, this is not enough. Uh, addressing climate change will really uh, require a rigorous effort uh, in 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 um, uh, bringing uh, down the emission, and that includes the data state. That includes ICT uh, services like data management centers and everything that requires a lot of heat, uh, that, that produce a lot of uh, heat. And that's why we are trying to explore as well different technologies, how to bring down the emission produced by data centers and other ICT equipments. So thank you very much. Uh, that's for me from our end. Thank you. Thanks, Rio. Um, let's turn to Sridhar. Yeah, I just wanted to answer uh, Sonam's question. I actually put in an answer the question online. So two things. In the short term, what is needed is a social protection measure so that food security needs are immediately addressed. So this could be through cash transfers or this could be through the provision of rations at uh, subsidized rates or at low rates or in cases free. I mean, that was a lot of it was done during the pandemic when uh, families were provided uh, rations so that they could tide over their immediate uh, needs. So that's one thing so that even for the time being that the families who are affected and the households can uh, get over their food security problem and focus on other important issues that they have. The second thing is to look at some long-term solutions to this, that if for it depends where the drought is and what is the uh, what is the situation with the, the land and water resources over there, what was being cultivated before, both in crops and also what other um, sectors such as livestock or fisheries, if any, were they active at that time. And then look at what is, if there's any rezoning required, agroecological zoning, and then see what is a more um, a practical or pragmatic agriculture plan that can be put into that place. So in your case, you talked about drought, and this is a recurring situation in quite a few countries in Asia. There are also other countries where there is much more water, so they don't know how to manage the water. So in both cases, food production is, um, is at risk. So there are both in terms of how to manage the land and the water, and also what are the kind of uh, options of what can be grown and what can't be grown, what livestock can be put in place or, or removed for that matter, can all be explored. So we have both things that need to be done, social protection and long-term agriculture planning. Thank you. Thank you, Estrada. And then over to Matsumi. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Damian. I'll also come briefly to the question from Sonam. And, and I want to thank my colleagues, uh, uh, Rio and, um, uh, and Sridhar for already providing the, the solutions that um, can be explored. Um, the issue that uh, Sonam is raising is very valid in terms of the most vulnerable, the, the women and the young the children are the ones that uh, often are in the receiving end. Uh, so what we are doing in UN Climate Change is actually to try to help countries or governments uh, in making sure that they are planning uh, prioritizes these groups. Um, there's a lot of learning that's going on. Uh, it's, it's improving over time. Currently, in the national adaptation plans that are being prepared by the countries, there's a, a stronger emphasis on, on gender, uh, or women more specifically. And we are looking at how governments create targeted programs. And this can go in different uh, dimensions. And I think as Rida was also highlighting, they can be short-term measures and long-term measures. Uh, for instance, some governments uh, put forward uh, dedicated funding windows uh, that enable uh, women to build their resilience um, and, and strengthen their adaptive capacity in case of uh, shocks like drought, like floods when they come. Um, and also there are specific policies that also in, in ensure that women and children are involved in the whole planning exercises. So there are uh, opportunities to make sure that that happens, that is enshrined in the policies. And I think uh, Having that short-term and long-term planning perspective into it is, is the key to making sure that the vulnerable groups are indeed the ones that are being targeted. Um, the whole system is doing that. It's just that, as I'm saying, the progress is a little bit slow, but I think with time, uh, there is a possibility that we can shift things, especially where the women find themselves more vulnerable than, 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 than men. This is often the case. Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, Montgomery. And then uh, Alexi, you wanted to come in as well. Uh, yeah, thanks. I uh, just wanted to really quickly um, address the LDC graduation questions and trade. Uh, so with regard to Bangladesh um, uh, and other graduating countries, whether they'll have any special treatment. Well, as developing countries, uh, they already have uh, differential treatment from the developed countries, uh, for example, in the WTO. Uh, this does not cover um, tariffs, but certain things such as um, uh, uh, subsidies, agricultural subsidies, uh, export subsidies, there's some leeway for developing uh, countries. Um, I'm not sure whether I'm trying to come up as a, a group of just graduated countries uh, to get some special preferences as the optimum way to go. I think uh, what, what they are doing now, including Bangladesh, is trying to substitute uh, the expiring preferences with trade agreements. Um, so, so Bangladesh, uh, it's important for them to have a trade agreement with uh, with India, one of their biggest partners. Uh, but also look at uh, Europe and the United States, and uh, who provide them um, those trade preferences. Uh, so, uh, and 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 as the UN, as ASCAP in particular, we also do give support to not just the LDCs, but um, uh, developing countries. So, for example, even though we, we just supported uh, Bangladesh to negotiate a trade agreement with India, uh, we now also supporting India to help them negotiate their trade agreement with uh, the European Union. So there's also always support for develop developing countries from the UN. Uh, this, the second question on graduation, with, uh, whether um, uh, one can postpone one's graduation, uh, uh, because of uh, you know volatile environment, and the answer is uh, yes. Uh, uh, from my understanding, uh, it's it's not just automatic graduation. You do you you uh, you do get a say in it, uh, and uh, in exceptional circumstances, you know it's up to the general assembly what to do. Uh, so that uh, definitely can be brought up by uh, at, at the forum to try to um, give certain. Uh, leeway, particularly with the COVID-19 pandemic uh, still having very negative impact. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alexei. Um, I know that we're way over time. Um, if the panel can indulge maybe one or two more questions, um, we can take them and then we'll, we can wrap up. Um, Mohammed, I see your hand up, but I'm not sure if that's an old hand, so to speak, or a new one. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for your reply. Actually, I do not have any particular question, but I want to say a few words regarding the LDCs. Uh, uh, many uh, countries will be graduating from the LDCs within the next uh, 15 or 20 years. Uh, do you, uh, what is your suggestions to continue good trade uh, uh, for uh, graduating LDCs. Uh, I want to suggestion because I have been writing on this issue for many years. Uh, it will be very uh, good for me. You suggest, I want to uh, uh, listen your suggestions. Uh, what the steps the graduating LDC should take so that uh, the countries can graduate, uh, graduate, graduate smoothly and it becomes sustainable. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Mohammed. Um, is there one final question that we can take before I hand back to, I see Alexei has his hand up. I don't see any. Um, so uh, over to you, uh, Alexei, if you wanna take that question. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, just uh, we um, we tried to take a look at the uh, what happened to the countries that have uh, already graduated and try to learn from their experience, at least from the trade perspective. And uh, the answer is uh, we can't really learn anything. There's not enough data. So 
uh, the few countries that have graduated and try to uh, move on, there's just not enough data to see whether uh, the stuff that they have done is, um, is successful. So for most of the time, it's actually new territory for LDC countries still to see how best to weather this uh, graduation process, uh, at least in terms of trade. Uh, but what I can uh, tell you, uh, at least from talking to countries that are uh, graduating, uh, such as Bangladesh and Vanuatu, who have just graduated, uh, uh, the, the biggest change from this category is, uh, from our understanding, is the trade related, because they lose all these preferences. So it's imperative to uh, ensure that the countries have uh, the uh, capacity, the Policymakers are able to negotiate trade agreements. Um, sorry, um, that they're able to um, uh, to figure out where which sectors are going to be impacted by graduating the most, and try to address that. Uh, you having the foresight, knowing that within five years, because the graduation process it's not it's not cold turkey. You'll have a leeway of a few years where those uh, tariffs expire. So it's very important to uh, ensure that those that matter are substituted because there is enough time to, to address those. Thank you. Thanks, Leslie. Um, so uh, colleagues, uh, with that, um, if if any of the other panel members have any burning issues they wanna uh, address, uh, please step in now. Uh, otherwise, um, I will, we'll wrap it up. I don't see any. Um, so really just a big thank you to, to everybody for attending. Uh, a huge thank you uh, to uh, my colleagues from across the UN uh, for taking the time. Um, I know it's, it's um, while the time difference has uh, worked for, for most of you, uh, I know it's also that uh, Motsomi has had to join from, from Bonn, so I know it's, it's super early in the morning there. Uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, as a reminder, um, for those of you who had uh, slideshow presentations, if you can please provide those. I'm sure the journalists would like to have access to that information. Um, and likewise, any uh, new reports that your, your organizations are launching in, uh, for HLPF, uh, feel free to share with us and we'll, we'll forward it on. Uh, and then just to say that um, we also have a similar webinar for the uh, um, LDCs. It's going to start at 9 a.m. Uh, local time here in New York, so that's just a, in a few hours from uh, for, for, for me at least. Um, but yeah, just a really huge thank you, um, and we'll stay in touch uh, as well. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.